Good morning. Um, as you're taking your Bible um, to prepare for the scriptural reading, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, or chapter 1 rather, verses 2 through 10. And you, if you would stand, um, and just a reminder that um, tonight we do have our Bible Institute, and the subject is Theology Matters in Science. And let me just say, it's they're all great and interesting, but this is particularly interesting because it helps, I think it will help you understand the dialogue that you hear in our society today. So um, I'm looking forward to that, and then I'm looking forward to some good discussion after that as talking with uh, some people here and being versed in philosophy and that sort of thing, in postmodernism, that's what we're going to deal with. So it's going to be a very relevant, they all are, but... And I'd encourage you either, if you're able to come, to come. If not, to please make sure that you take the time to listen to these online. The church has gone to great effort to make them available to you. So, hear the word of the Lord. If you have your pew Bible there, page 927, your own personal Bible, I uh, will read chapter 1, verse 2 through 10 of First Thessalonians. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, labor of love, steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brethren, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So that you became an example to all believers in Macedonia and in Acacia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Acacia. But your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Amen. You may be seated. Just a reminder that your bulletin has a basic outline in the back. And you can fill in the points as you feel led. But uh, what we're going to talk about this morning from this particular text is a church under pressure. And I think that this is uh, very appropriate concerning the times that we live in. And as we look at it, I, I want you to concentrate on your outline. Okay, so if you have that, uh, the, rear, the back end of your bulletin there. So we see the first section, an, an energized church, verses 2 through 4. And then we see an exemplar church, uh, verses 5 through 7. And then we see an expected church, 8 through 10. Just by way of a humorous note, generally when I make sermon outlines, and I've been preaching in one way or another for almost 40 years, they don't usually line up like this with all E's so, or all the same letter. That just happened to have happened, so whatever, you can take it or leave it. So as we approach this, we have two, we have two goals in mind. Our first goal is to understand the text and, and observe what Paul saw in this church that he had planted. Okay, that's number one. And obviously to emulate it or... or, or that's, let it be an example to us. So, so you should be looking, as, a, as we work it through, you should be looking at fruit that you want to pick. Now, I've picked fruit in the past, and uh, you, sometimes you pick selectively, uh, and that's what I want you to do. I want you to have your mind tuned in so that you begin to pick selectively examples from this church that you would want to emulate in your own life. And then I, I really want you to work with me in thinking through the text, okay? 
Everyone can hear, can read for the most part in different degrees. I understand that. I'm not necessarily the best reader, but I've just trained myself how to learn. And as, as we think through the text, I, I want you to be a cooperative listener. Not just hearing, but I want you to begin to work at, and perhaps you already, that you're, you're just not listening to the text, but you're able to take your own Bible and, and go with me verse by verse and, and start to come to some of the conclusions that I'm giving to you. So this is what we do in the Institute. As I mentioned before, it, we're, not, we're not interested in just a, a passive audience, but an audience that engages the word and learns how to engage it yourself. Because suffice it to say, uh, as David said, uh, his law, was, God's law is what a lamp under our feet, a light under a path. So how do you know God? You know him through the word. If you're saying, oh no, I just know him on the golf course, then you're not knowing the true God in a full way because all you're doing is seeing God in nature. But as you study your Bible and you interact with it, it begins to reveal truth. Sanctify them through the word. The word is truth. So you're, you're able to begin to look at the language and then you begin to understand. And I had a rather, rather lengthy discussion with a guy the other day on confessions from the church as, as we follow here and how critical they are as deductions from the texts. And he said, oh, no, no, we just, we just study the Bible. I said, that's true. That's quite true. But when you study it to show yourself to prove it unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, and obviously those words are Timothy, but when you begin to integrate that, then you begin to deduce truth about God and you grow in your knowledge of him. So I want you to really, really work on that as you follow me through with that. So uh, as you have your text open before you, and I encourage your Bible open before you, um, uh, for me, that's the easiest to follow. If you can follow it on a phone, that's, that's up to you, but I want you to follow with me. But first thing that we'll do as we approach this text is just lay a very quick background. And from this, uh, you're, most of you have study Bibles, but I'm using a Ryrie study Bible here. And this is what Charles Ryrie says, Paul, Silas, and Timothy first went to Macedonian port of Thessalonica on the second missionary journey, Acts 17, 1 through 14. So as soon as you get to look at an epistle, right, in your, right immediately your mind goes to Acts and says, well, where does this fit in? Okay, so that's where it fits in. This was the second place the gospel was preached in Europe, Philippi being the first. Because the preaching of the gospel depleted the ranks of the synagogue, the Jews charged Paul's host Jason with harboring traitors to Caesar. The rulers of the city took Jason as security like a peace bomb and let the missionaries leave the city. When they arrived in Athens, Paul sent back to Thessalonica to encourage the believers and report back to them. So that's, that's what you want to do as you begin to study, not just yourself, but even as we hear messages from the pulpit. You, you want to know where it fits, okay? And that, that's our view of truth. This, it's a progressive narrative from Genesis to Revelation. So when, again, when you approach the text, you're not just picking an apple off the tree and say, well, yeah, I'll, I'll derive some devotional content from this. No, no, you're, you're, you know where it fits. You know where it is. And, and you can get the theology of the whole text as you plug it into your worldview. So point one, let's look at this. Uh, again, take your Bible there, and I think uh, I hope you have your outline there. And as we look at this, an energized church, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, we just want to remember that this church was planted in the midst of tribulation. They, they experienced a lot of tribulation. Uh, they made a distinctive abandonment of the Gentile culture, particularly the idolatry. Keep that in the back of your mind, and that's why I said from the beginning, this is, <laughs> this is a church that in many ways we want to emulate. So as you have your outline before you, and this is, this is how we approach this now. Now what, what do you see from this church? You're going to see priorities under pressure, all right? Let me emphasize that. You're going to see that their priorities surfaced because of pressure. And as, frankly, I feel a little uncomfortable about the, the direction of the way our country, a lot uncomfortable for that matter, uh, and then realizing, well, the church is going to be in a vice here. But I've seen from this text that when this happens, it's actually a benefit because then our priorities become clearer. Okay? It's not a comfortable thing. 
but that's what happens. So, first, as verse 2 says, we give thanks to God always for you all making mention of you in our prayers. Paul is thanking them because he is recognizing the obvious working of God that they are alive. Okay? Paul always commands to give thanks, right? And everything to give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Uh, and there's, there's a reason for this, because when you're a thankful person, first to God, you have your priority, you begin to see his working, and you begin to see the many things that he's doing, and the doctrine of providence becomes much more real to you, okay? And the doctrine of providence is the control of all things. And just, again, uh, as a humorous note, on my way driving here last week, I was driving my old Camry, and I thought, you know what, I, I hope this thing makes it to church, because I don't have a cell phone at this point. Well, it did, but uh, this week when I got in to drive it, it was done. The water pump was out, the timing belt has to be changed. So I kind of smirked and said, well, that certainly is the providence of God. Thank you, Lord, that it happened on Wednesday and not Sunday, because... Uh, Hitchhiking nowadays isn't too successful, all right? I've done it in the past, and it was very successful, but that's uh, 50 years ago. So this is what Paul saw, and he saw a church that came alive from dead paganism. So he, he was very, very thankful for this, and he planted the church. And what a blessing to Paul to, to have gone through this effort and see the fruit. Now, as we look at this, we're going to look at the, some particulars in what he saw now. And if you have your Bible there, we're going to go to verse 3. And, and these are the marks of life, okay? And here again, I, I want to encourage you to try to work through the structure of the past. We have passage here. We have a Thanksgiving, and now we have the particulars. Verse 3, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith, labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. This church uh, didn't retreat in the fray, all right? They, they were being oppressed not just by the pagan world, but even the Jewish community as well. So this is a very important distinctive here that they produced fruit amidst the fray. Three issues here that should mark a church, okay? Look at your Bible. First one, work of faith. This work of faith is not salvation by works. They are already saved because of the imputed righteousness of Christ. This work of faith is activity. It's energy that comes out of a saving faith. Saving faith produces energy. Just as in the dead state, dead in trespasses and sins, that produces a negative energy, doesn't it? It, pro it produces a path that you serve, I serve the lust of the flesh. But it's quite clear that saving faith produces a positive energy in the sense of the working of the Spirit of God in us. But a couple categories I want to just mark out here that what are these works of faith? Well, first is, is you think unilaterally across your Bible, you say, well, it's obviously the use of our gifts. That's a work of faith to build the kingdom. And if you're here this morning, uh, I want to challenge you, and this might make you feel a little uncomfortable, but it's for a good reason. You should know your spiritual gifts. You should be able to go to 1 Corinthians 12 and other sections in 1 Peter and Romans, and you should say, well, I know I definitely have these gifts. Myself, I definitely have the gift of teaching, and I also have the gift of helps, okay? And I, and I endeavor to use them. So if, if you don't know your spiritual gifts, um, in some respects you may still be using them but not really know what they are. But, but if you know them, then, then you're going to use them. And just as I get to know some of you folks in this church, I, I could begin to point out a couple of individuals who I know definitely have the gift of helps, all right? I won't point them out necessarily, but, but it's quite obvious in what they do and what they do in serving the church here. So if you're going to produce works of faith out of your position, then first you've got to know, real. wait a second, this means not just going to church, it means that I have gifts for the use of the body and I've got I to gotta use them. Not only that, uh, Paul, 
uh, I think as he recognizes just the situation that they're in, and we should be very keen on the use of our uh, resources. And he dealt with this in Titus, that we should be zealous for good works, but also zealous uh, to help one another with, with our resources, okay? Uh, now, this may grade us a little bit, being uh, Americans and extremely independent in many good ways, and that, that does have a benefit to it. But by the same, same token, it's very essential for us to, in the lieu of coming, let's just say, persecution and what we can see is coming, as he says to Titus, our people must also learn to engage in good deed to meet the pressing needs so that we will not be unfruitful. So another one of this work of faith comes out of uh, what we are and what we use our resources for. You know, every time I read Voice of the Martyrs, I, I just think, man, I, I wish I had more revenue to um, contribute to that ministry. But one thing that strikes me is the funds that they have to help those who are persecuted, particularly widows that lose their husbands in persecution. So if, if you're getting it, your mind starts to think that way and says, wait a second, this is a, the church universal, and I have lots of resources, and I should be sharp at saying, I have this money. Do I want to spend it on a vain idol or something I don't really need? that I already have something that meets the purpose? Or do I want to start to sharpen this mindset of using my resources for the church at large, etc.? So the biggest work of faith, then, is it's all new priorities. We have, our priorities now are advancement of the kingdom of God. I know when I was converted, oh my, I don't even, that's, uh, I was 22, I'm 66 almost. <laughs> it, instantly, my priorities changed. So I, I stopped going to this part of town where the partying was and started going to this part of town where the church was. And then out of that came many, many activities. So let me just challenge you in that. The first, the work of faith. Notice that back to your text, Paul says the labor of love. So what is this labor of love? It's, it's really connected with the work of faith, but the language he uses here is very particular. And that's why in the Bible Institute, we encourage you to understand what word studies are and syntax and grammar, because labor here has the idea of, of strenuous labor that has a cost. Strenuous labor that has a cost that's come out of love, and love is our new ethic, isn't it? Love is, it's not about me, it's about you, see? But it's quite interesting that Paul makes this point, because this is not the self-centered paganism that is me-centered, but it's, it's other-centered with a love that costs something, all right? So when I hear people say, oh, I don't want to go to the ministry, i got to drive too far. Or I, I don't want to do that, I have to do this. Come on now, wake up a little bit. As you exercise biblical love, you know it's going to cost something. And not only that, it's, you're, you many times as you get involved with people, you, you will have emotional scars and battles. It gets messy. All right, you see that from the ministry. It gets messy at times. But yet that does not exempt us from reaching out into other people's domain to share biblical love with them in the form of works I've just taught, uh, said about and uh, many others. Alvin Schmidt's book, uh, How Christianity Changed the World, uh, we've mentioned that in the Institute. And it's a treatise on how the church changed the world, and I'll even deal with that tonight, uh, theology matters in science. But one of the areas that was quite pronounced, pronounced in the early church was their value of human life. So they stood against abortion. Uh, they, they stood against genocide. Uh, they stood against infanticide. And they stood against the idolatry of the culture. And in fact, some commentators say this, uh, just by way of allusions, in Galatians 5, 20, where Paul is talking about the works of the flesh to be put off. He says, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery. We usually think of that as, oh, as Christians, there's a strong prohibition against witchcraft or any kind of involvement in the cult. That's true. But some commentators say he, he's actually talking about 
the, pra the practice of abortion by abortifactants in that culture. And, and calling them out under that and saying, Paul, Paul's hitting this hard and saying this is, this is a no-go for the Christian. The participation in the culture of using herbal abortifactants or whatever they use. So here again, they, they took a very... <laughs> They took a very clear stand in the culture, and it, they were also noted for their love, weren't they? Yes, the early pagans or the early Christians, whereas because the pagan community uh, was just very, very self-centered. So this is a costly love, but it's modeled by the atonement, isn't it? That's the interesting thing. Our, our moral example gave himself. He's not just a moral example. We know that, but he gave himself completely. It's the agape love, the love that comes out of the will. And as we look at this, we realize that, well, this is a rather sobering analysis that we have to think about. And let me ask you this. Um, are you involved in other people's lives? Not just through the auspices of the church, but do, do you have that mindset as a Christian that uh, I want to serve other people in one way or another, not just with the work of evangelism, but just helping them in, in a wide variety of ways as a Christian. And let me say this, if, if we don't do this, our Christianity be, will be dry. I see this when I talk to people, oh, I'm bored, you know, the church just bores me, they don't have anything to offer me. I said, well, let me ask you a, a very poignant question. What are you doing? What are, you, what are you doing as far as involvement in the church? Are you in any ministries? Are you helping anybody? Do you, are you aggressively sharing the love of Christ with people? And many times, you, as I know these people and talk to them, they're not doing anything other than complaining. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a lot to this. It's very rich. So this is, this is what we should be doing. Now back to your Bible. So we've seen this work of faith, labor of love, steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. The pagan world was hopeless. You know, it was incre incredibly licentious with all sorts of perversions and sexual immorality and the whole family structure was just deleted. It's very similar to today. And this is the context that the church was planted in. And it's quite obvious as you would read it, you'd see this, the, the, and know anything about the pagan culture, it was very sent on self-gratification, okay, which we see today. And unfortunately, when we see the hopelessness, the self-gratification, we see sexual depravity at its height. So th this is a natural progression. But, but this church was founded in that context and they, they were a people, as your Bible says there, go back to your text there, verse 3, uh, that had a steadfastness of hope or, or, or a perseverance of hope. So this wasn't just a sullen endurance that, well, we'll put up with these things. It, it was a, a triumphant spirit that proceeded on with the work of building the kingdom. And again, you know, all you got to do is just start looking at church history, all right? And, and look at some of these examples. William Carey, the great missionary, we call him the father of modern missions, came from a strong Calvinistic tradition. Missionary to India, uh, lost his wife, lost a child, suffered horrendously for the work of the gospel as he worked in India, but he was asked his secret. He says, I can plod. I can plod. I can move one step at a time. Because his mind was rooted in this biblical hope. Or I'm thinking of the great uh, missionary Roland Bingham who started a Sudan Interior Mission. Okay, <laughs> yeah, it's about the 1890s. So him and his two partners come to the west coast of Africa and they're going to go the whole way across to Sudan. And they were warned by the missionaries on the coast that says, you won't see the Sudan and neither were your grandfathers. You, maybe your grandchildren will, rather. Uh, but at their, first, at their first endeavor, two died. That was it. They didn't see it. The Bingham came back to Canada and regrouped, and they kept trying. But he, he, he had this mindset, as the quotes, uh, I read this of him. He said this, we, we won't be driven. Imagine that. We will not be driven. 
Do, do we have that endurance of hope as we pursue our Christian experience, particularly in the area of ministry? Expect great things from God, attempt great things from God. That's what Carrie said. So one of the things that I want to encourage this church as many as, as others is that we need this steadfastness of hope. But, but we, all, we also need just, the, uh, uh, let's just say, a rebirth of the grit. And I'm not saying nobody has it, believe me, many have it, that, w- that we need to step out for kingdom work. I would hope that there's some in this church as well as others that are in young people in particular that God's tugging on them and saying, hey, you know what? You, you, you need to think missions. You need to think India. You need to think Africa. You need to think a hard place. And this isn't for everybody, but he grips people and says, you, you need to step out here. That's probably not a rhetoric you're going to hear too often in some churches. In others, you will hear it, particularly my background. Uh, that's why I treasure my good old fundamental Baptist background, because they were hammering that step out, step out. So that's quite a challenge to us to realize that we don't want to be so integrated and self-centered that there's not going to be some of us that God's going to say, okay, I'm going to launch you out this endurance that comes from the hope of the second coming of Jesus Christ, steadfastness of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. It should drive us. These are areas, uh, these characteristics, do they describe you? Do they describe this church? And let's take a sober analysis. There's a reason for this energy, though. And it's not man-centered, isn't it? <laughs> there it is, verse 4. And, th- and this is, and some of you might have been English teachers here, but you, you'd see this, the statement that he made in verse 3, the, the three things he recognized, and you see a nice participle hanging down from that. As your Bible tells you, you should be with me in verse 4, knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. In other words, Paul is saying, I've recognized these in you, because of God's divine election, his choosing of you for himself. And I like that Paul, he just loves that word brethren. 21 times he uses it in these two books, knowing brethren beloved by God, his choice of you. In other words, his, his mindset is, this, this is our family. We all have our personal families, that's great. But our, our ultimate eternal family is the, the kingdom of God, those who are believers. But he makes this very clear point. I've recognized this fruit in you, work of faith, labor of love, endurance of hope, out of your hope, because God has chosen you for himself. Now, is that something that we put a badge on and say, well, I'm the, the, uh, the elect of God, the two, th- or the two eclectos to you. I think that's a, I might have some of the vowels wrong. No, not at all. It's, it's a mark of humility that says, God has picked me out for this and there's a particular energy in me because of his eternal purpose. And this energy is the person of the Holy Spirit. So there's quite an obligation with this. This isn't an optional. So the fact that God is in his infinite wisdom and his mystery, chosen us for himself, he has given to us the spirit of God and says, okay, my, my sovereign decree, will, decreed will to choose you now should produce in you also a purpose, a drive to advance the kingdom because that's who you are. So now we look at the second section. Again, stay with me in the text as you think through this. Um, we, we've looked at the first section, but now we, we have an exemplar church. An exemplar here means an, another example, uh, verses 5 through 7. But there's, there's some theological statements in here that are very, very critical to your Christian worldview, to your theology, to your life. So stay with me on this text. Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with conviction. Verse 5a. Gospel is the divine announcement. It's the declaration of life. It's just not an optional statement. It is absolutely critical that we as a church understand this. 
because there are elements of the church moving in the progressive direction who push the centrality of the, of the death and resurrection of Christ away. And, and we have to say, woe is you, the false shepherds in some cases. Very, very serious thing. It's a serious thing to deny the atonement as the gospel is preached to you. Very serious. But it's incredibly serious to say that as a minister, you're denying this. Because this is the very core of the whole Christian faith. And, and Paul makes it very clear by using, well, you're familiar with the word, the gospel, the good news. But that's critical in the age that we live in. And why was it so essential there? Well, back to your Bible, because Paul clarifies it. He says, our gospel didn't come in word only. Not in word only, and I'm sure he had in mind the, the pagan philosophers of the first century who were spouting all sorts of axioms and, axioms and, and ways. And all you got to do is go to his encounter at Athens on Mars Hill, the unknown God. So Paul is very, very sternly in a good way saying this gospel is the announcement of life. This is what it's all about. All, all those other pagan philosophies word only. Not that there would never ever be anything of value out of them. We concede that to a degree. But the preeminency of this message. But notice what he says back in your Bible there. In power. What, why, why is it in power? Because... Paul said, what, uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. So there's an, there's an authority in it because the gospel is not just an offered message that we just offer people and say, well, take it or leave it, take it or leave it. No, it has the authority in it to bring God's people to himself. And that's why you have missionaries like this go out. And I'm not saying all missionaries went out from the Reformed tradition, but in the early ages of the modern missions movement from England, Many of the Scottish missionaries were of that tradition. And, and they were the people that packed their belongings in coffins and went to the west coast of Africa and thought, well, I'm doing this because i got about 16 months to live. Some fever will kill me. And they knew that. But they went with this conviction and said, wait a second. Uh, <laughs> this message has power. There shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord and glory of the Lord. That, that was their mindset. So this message that Paul is describing here of what they received is, is efficacious. It will accomplish it. Notice back to your Bible, uh, the third, third distinctive, he says um, that um, with the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Spirit. And all you have to do is turn over to First Peter and you know the ministry of the Spirit, the sanctifying work of the Spirit. And in the beginning, he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who chosen according to the foreknowledge of the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. For the what purpose? To obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. You know, when these, some of these missionaries went, <laughs> they went into rather, let's just say, a dramatic, dramatic, Context, they're walking into people that have been in bondage for centuries. New Guinea. The, the demonic confrontation was, was incredibly real. But they, they walked in with this confidence that says, this isn't a waste of my time. God, God has promised that he would draw his people from every kindred, tongue, tribe, and nation. So they, they went in with the fortitude that said, no. And even I did to some degree in my own humble way uh, when I went to Africa that um, I said, no, I, I'm, I'm going here because um, God, God's going to do something. Hopefully I will. I'll have the strength to do it. I was a teacher there. Uh, but, and he did in many ways. So this is an exemplar church. This is the efficacy of this gospel that we preach. But no, back to your Bible, notice what he says at the end. Just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among for your sake. So he entered into a raw pagan world. But it was, as he says in Galatians, it was the, the fullness of time, wasn't it? it? It was the time for this coming of this gospel. 
I encourage you to be reading uh, missionary biographies. Turn your television off. That's up to you how much you want to turn it off, but turn it off and read good missionary biographies. And this one is of Darlene Diver Rose. Uh, it's just a great one. She was a, a missionary to uh, New Guinea in World War II uh, with her husband, Russell. And it wasn't long, the Japanese came and they were then, she was taken away with the other uh, women missionaries and interned in a Japanese camp. And uh, the leader of the camp, uh, Commandant Mr. Yamaji, uh, typical Japanese, very cool in this context. But it was very interesting as she served in this camp, I think she's about three years, <laughs> that this, this gentleman ex respected her. And she was even had the audacity to, he, she was called to his office, and this is what he says, what she said. She went in, in, in trepidation and fear, and the suffering these people went through were incredible. And I quote from this book, uh, Evidence Not Seen, page 111. Mr. Yamaji, I do not sorrow like people who have no hope. I want to tell you about someone of whom you may never have heard. I learned about him when I was a little girl in Sunday school back in Boone, Iowa, in America. His name is Jesus. He is the son of Almighty God, the creator of the heaven and earth. God opened the most wonderful opportunity to lay the plan of salvation before the camp commander. Tears started to stray down his truth. Cheeks, he died for you, Mr. Mamaji, and he puts love in our hearts, even for those who are enemies. What a statement, considering the amount they suffered. That's why I don't hate you, Mr. Yamaji. May God, my, maybe God brought me to this place at this time to tell you he loves you. This is, this, <laughs> This, this ought to just touch your heart. With tears running down his cheek, he rose hastily and went into his bedroom, closing the door. I could hear him blowing his nose and knew he was crying. He later on got saved. And this, this was a very harsh commandant who had murdered, actually murdered someone, and that, that was quite common. But there it is, isn't it? The, the efficacy of the power of the gospel to go into these places and sound out the trumpet of God's salvation to the hearts he's prepared. Amen to that. Well, as we continue to think through this exemplar church, I've pointed out to you the efficacy of the power of the gospel. And now we want to just look briefly at how great of examples they were. Back to your Bible, you became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So they welcomed the word. And the, the, the term Paul uses here for tribulation is being squeezed in a wine press. All right? They welcomed it with the joy of the Holy Spirit. And my question is, you know, why, why was it welcomed? It, it was welcomed, in my opinion, because I think these, these people, they saw the emptiness of paganism. And, and that's quite the case with, with some of our fellow believers um, who are in the third world in very oppressive situations. And you say, my, how, how can they make the stand for this? They confess Christ and they suffer so greatly for it. Well, I, I, I submit to you that uh, they're so at the end of themselves with the way they're living to realize, wow, this is a hope. And it's very difficult for us in America because of our materialism. We get blinded. But these people accepted it with, with much, much joy in the Holy Spirit. But Paul makes a very important point here, as you see in verse 7, so that you became examples to all believers in Macedonia and Acacia. The, these people, their testimony and the way they received the word and the, the fruit they produced began to be a showcase before all Acacia and Macedonia. That's a very sobering thing for this reason that, guess what? <laughs> I, I, I'm not the only one on this stage this morning, okay? Preaching. If, if you're a Christian, you're on this stage with me because your, your life is a declaration of the faith for either good or bad. And... I always ask myself the question, you know, is, is my testimony good? Am, am I conducting myself in a way that is conducive to the glory of God? And one of the things in counseling, you know, you beg people not to do things at certain times, and they, they want to 
step away from a marriage or they want to step away from a situation. And I have to say, look, <laughs> yeah, maybe you can just function in a, in a nominal way, but there's a bigger picture here. You know, you're, you're on the stage. You're a believer. People are looking at you. And you, you defame the, the glory of God, then that's not good. There's, there's consequences to that. So that, that's why this church is such a model that they realize this and, and what they produced, what they produced was the whole world will see him. So the interesting thing about that is um, how much more do you think in our culture as, as we stand for what we want to stand for that this is going to be an exemplar? It's going to be an example. Now, it may not be tolerated, and some people may not like it, but other people may, may be encouraged by it. Says, wait a second, these people, they've got some priorities. You know, I remember when I drove a concrete truck years ago. Well, I'm going way back into the 80s and uh, late ni early 90s, and then I said to my employer, you know what, I pr really appreciate you letting me work here, but I'm, I'm a mis going as a missionary to Africa. And some of the other guys were a little bit, oh, wow, what do you want to do that for? And they were, they were genuine in their concern. And I said, no, man, you, wild horses couldn't drag me away from this, all right? We wanted to do it so bad. And uh, that, I think in a good way, um, it reflected our priorities. They said, no, this is, this is what our priorities are. And that's, that's, again, what we should be doing. This was an exemplar church who, what they were doing, the whole world, they were on stage. St. John's is on stage, okay, whether you believe it or not. No, it's not a big stage necessarily, but it will become a bigger stage. Well, the last consideration that we want to look at is this was an expectant church. And what, what came out of this model church, as Paul called it, an example, um, was the clear picture of conversion. Look at your Bible, verse 8. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you not only in Macedonia and Acacia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything. Again, Paul uses the word of the Lord here. This is a, a thus saith the Lord. It's, it's, it's not an optional TED talk that we're presenting to the society that we live in. I emphasize that again. What we preach, what we teach, what we believe is a thus saith the Lord. And this is a challenge because we, we live in a very, let's just say, profigurate society, but we also live amidst a church at times that is pulling back from that and saying, well, we've, we've got to alter the text. We've got to alter our view of the authority of Scripture so that we can accommodate the culture. No, that's... That's not Paul's view. Not that we're insensitive to cultural issues, particularly in the work of missions, but it's, it's very clear here that he pronounced the word as a sovereign, de solemn declaration of the salvation of Jesus Christ. So we, we should take heart to that example there. But also, if you're back to your Bible, uh, they were characterized by their faith in God. Uh, a, a distinctive mark away from the early pagans and their polytheism. So their faith wasn't just church, okay? It, it was an, an obvious exercise of a living relationship with God himself. Let me ask you this. Um, if your neighbor, um, if I asked your neighbor, I said, hey, I know such and such, he goes to St. John's to our church here. What's he like? And would, would your neighbor say, well, he's a nice guy? Or, oh, he's very religious. He seems to know a lot about the Bible. Or um, hopefully this neighbor would say, you know what? This guy really lives his faith. He's just so consumed by this Christianity. He's very faithful in his church. He is, yes. He aggressively raises his kids. He nurtures them. And, and he's, he just goes to the extent of just his family life, the way he treats his wife is very impressive. 
The, but interestingly about this guy, he, he weathers his trials. Yes, he has emotions, he has feelings, but he weathers his trials. And not only this, this guy's always helping somebody. Oh, always there for someone who needs it. So I would say that that guy was modeling a faith toward God that was quite clear in his conversion. Well, that brings us then to another aspect of this model, and it's, and it's this. It, they modeled a clear conversion, didn't they? If you have your Bible there, again, uh, verse 9, For they themselves report about what kind of reception we had with you, how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. So there was an obvious turn in their life turning from the idols of the vanity of the culture that they lived in. And the great commentator Leon Morris quotes F. F. Filson in this. He says, in government, religion, business, amusement, labor, and social clubs, the pagan world was built on the pattern of polytheism, whereas the attitude of apostolic Christianity to the polytheistic world was one of militant hostility. Imagine that, militant hostility. Hostility, Not in a negative way, because remember I said how much the first century church benefited the culture. But to examine, examine ourselves in our conversion, turn, turning away from the idols that destroy us, vanities of all sorts. Uh, do, do we have that militant hostility that was seeking God? With the, with the fervor that the psalmist talks about. And notice what he says in your text, verse 9 again, that he, they turned from idols to serve a living and true God. We have a relationship, a living God. It's, it's not a philosophy. We have a religion, and I'm proud of it. It's the Christian religion. But the Christian religion is very much, it is a relationship. And not only that, he describes God as the true God. Here again, let's just think about the culture that we live in, and to make that statement is rather profound. And I will make that tonight in the lecture on theology matters and science, that theology is the queen of sciences. And just chew on that one, those who will come tonight. Theology is the queen of sciences. So this church has just presented a fantastic model of a clear testimony of a, a, on a living church, a church that uh, has clearly turned from the idolatrous practices of the society and is showing a relationship with the living and true God. Verse 10 concludes the picture, and he, Paul says this about them, to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead as Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. Here's that adage of hope again that Paul often brings in that they're, they're living and working but waiting. You know, our culture says you work, you have a good job, you make a lot of money, you can't wait to retire, and then you kind of relax. But it's interesting, you know, as I talk to people in that stage, that what's going to happen after your retirement? Oh, I don't know. Well, <laughs> this, this short tenure on this earth is a preparation for eternity, so it's probably something you should be thinking about. But this church characterized itself by that mindset of, of waiting for the second coming of Jesus Christ, but they were quite busy while they were doing it. And you know, that's, that's one of those things that gives meaning to our life, isn't it, as we, as we do things, knowing that they're not in vain. But the other, the other parentheses is the conclusion of all things. But it closes with, a, a, let's just say, a, a, for lack of time, uh, a rather controversial eschatological statement here. He says that in verse 10, he raised from the dead, that is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. In my opinion, that's eternal wrath. And you, you could look at that eschatologically in a variety of ways. But it, but it is important to retain that understanding of who God is. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Because there's, again, a distinct movement in the progressive church to say we don't like that term wrath. It's not congruent with our understanding of God. But we, we fully embrace it as, as part of God's righteous character, his, his hatred for sin, his contempt for it. Because guess what? 
If you lose that, you lose the glory of the cross. Let me say that again. If, if you lose that, you lose the glory of the cross. Because the glory of the cross is he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might be made the, the righteousness of God in him. And he is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but the sins of the whole world, as John says. So we, we dutifully say, yes, God's vehemence against sin, but we, on the other hand, exalt his grace in the sense that, wow, <laughs> he's the one that delivered us. He's the one that stood in our stead. So that's the glory of the atonement. That's the glory of the mercy of God. And for those who, who don't see the judgment of God, they don't, they don't get the cross either. An energized faith, working, loving, enduring. Okay, I hope you've got that. A confident bearing of the message because it's effectual. Not the words of men, but it's powerful. Bears the authority of the Spirit. It's not complex philosophy, although we defend it with that. A clear testimony of faith in a true God in a multicultural society. And a satisfaction that our lives are not lived in vain. Amen.